So happy you're able to join me for the next 20, 30 minutes or so as we dive into another section in the letter to the Philippian church by the Apostle Paul. Well, a couple weeks ago, we launched a brand new teaching series on the letter to the Philippian church. And so we're going to be diving in just to a few verses here in just a moment in chapter one. But before we do that, thank you for your support. Thank you for jumping on our website, www.myfaithchurch.org. Your contributions are always welcome. Hopefully you're taking advantage as well of some of our free resources that we've made available to you. Our Right Now Media account that you can have your own account, uh, access to all kinds of cool stuff throughout the week that you can browse, as well as, excuse me, instructions of how to, down, how to download the YouVersion Bible app. I just want to give a bit of a shout out here as well. If you do not receive our text alerts, this is going to become real important as the winter weather is here. It is pretty chilly outside as I'm looking out the window now, but if you do not receive those, you can get up-to-date information uh, regarding whether we have to adjust or cancel services coming up as well as other information as well. Don't worry, we're not going to send something to you every single day, but we would encourage you to text my faith church one word to this number 888-403-4294. You will be happy that you're able to do that. Well, if you were able to join us last week, we looked at really the, just the first handful of verses in chapter one of this letter to the Philippian church. If you're able to join us a couple weeks ago, we gave you a flyby, sort of a drones view approach of the letter to the Philippian church. Paul talks about, in the first handful of verses, about his joy, about how is his joy is grounded, what it is founded in, and he talks about the gospel. This is what allows him to have joy no matter what circumstance that he's in, no matter what he has faced. And if you were able to join us a couple weeks ago, we gave you a little bit of the background, how Paul came to this city called Philippi, never intended to be there. Um, in fact, he desired to go other places that he had previously visited and encourage fellow believers there that he knew. But the, the Holy Spirit led him to this church, and when he arrived there, there was all kinds of horrible things that occurred. He tries to find someone that he was sure he was going to find. Uh, he had a vision of this man that said, come over, we want, we want to hear what you have to say. And yet he had never found this man. He's just described in the scripture as the, as the man from Macedonia. It's the first, uh, you know, he's been ghosted by this guy, right? It's the first context of that. Uh, while he's there, he's hassled by a, a, a lady who was demon-possessed for several days. Paul's just trying to have conversations with people about who Jesus is. And here's this lady who's demon-possessed, who's just trying to put a wrench in everything that Paul's doing. Finally, he just deals with her. And as a result, he's beaten. He's thrown into prison. Um, while he's there, uh, a miracle happens, though. And, and the, the shackles fall off of his of his hands and the jailer rushes in, if you're familiar with Acts chapter 16, rushes in and, and feels like, you know what, I'm going to be killed because all the prisoners are going to be gone. The, the doors are, are off the hinges. And yet Paul says, no, 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 don't hurt yourself. We're, we're all here. And that guy places his faith in the Lord. He and his entire household. There was another household, a, a, a lady's household by the name of Lydia that actually came to know the Lord as well. And that is how that gathering of believers, that is how that the church in Philippi starts. Now, if Paul would have looked back at that time, it, it was horrible. I mean, he was mistreated. He was beaten. He was thrown into prison. He was uh, harassed and, and, and hassled. And there was just two families of the time that he spent there that actually came to, to know the Lord. It wasn't hundreds and hundreds of people, just two households. But yet, when Paul looks back on this, he's able to say, oh, what a great time, right? I mean, the, my joy in, in you guys. And he goes, he actually says, I can't wait to get back there. And by the way, when Paul's writing this, a man from the, Philipp, the, the Philippian church has come to, to visit him, to encourage him, and, and to bring him a gift. And that man actually almost dies. And probably Paul's never met this guy until he got there. And yet Paul is in prison. He's writing about 
about joy, right? Now, after he writes about joy, he, he says something that perhaps we wouldn't expect him to say. He says, this is what I have been praying about you to the Lord. Now, I've been praying, this is the topic, this is the subject matter of, of, of my prayer. And you would imagine, out of the experience that Paul had, of being in that city and all the persecution, that was a tough place to live. It was very nationalistic. Um, it was sort of a, a haven when Roman soldiers would, 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 would retire. It was sort of a kind of a retirement community for, for Roman soldiers. And, and Christians were viewed as very unpatriotic. They wouldn't bow down and worship Caesar. Um, they were looked at as very, very bad for the economy as well because they would not participate in some of these feasts and festivals of these various trade guilds to these various gods that were linked oftentimes to these trade guilds, right? And so they were looked at as, as very unpatriotic and, and very bad for the economy. And you imagine in a place where the city was just filled with, with ex-Roman soldiers that Christians were not welcome. You know, sort of like Jews living in Nazi Germany. And just, you know, they were just not welcomed there. So you would imagine that if Paul has one shot to say, this is what I've been praying for you to the Lord, that would have been something physical. I, I, I pray for your protection, or I pray that the, the persecution wouldn't be so intense, or, or I pray for greater favor, you know, that somehow people would, would come to see you differently. But Paul doesn't pray for any of this. What is so interesting, the topic of Paul's prayer is not anything that we would probably think he would pray for. Very interesting that Paul, whenever he says, I'm praying for people, when he writes, and he does this in a number of his, letter, of his letters, either to the Romans, the, the Colossians, Galatians, and he, he always says, this is what I've been praying to the Lord for you. He never once mentions physical issues. Now, Paul obviously did pray for physical issues, people who were sick. He prayed for himself. He tells us that he had this thorn in the flesh, and he's prayed three times for it. And the Lord said, stop praying. You know, you're, this is not going to be taken away. And Paul says, well, you know, your grace is sufficient for me. And it's not those, those, those things are unimportant. But they're not as, as important as some of these spiritual issues. So what, what does Paul pray for, for this particular gathering of believers that he knew was a tough place to be, to live as a follower of Jesus? Well, let me go ahead and read. There's just a handful of verses. In fact, just chapter or verse one, uh, verse nine, verse ten, and verse eleven of chapter one. This is where Paul tells the Philippian believers, "This is what I've been praying to you guys about." For he says, "In this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more." And then everything after that is a description or a definition of what he has just said. He's praying for their love. He is praying that their love, and then he gives a description of what mature love looks like. So he is praying for their love. And he's not praying so much for the love that they should have for their city or the love that they should have for people who have not yet placed their faith in, in, in Jesus. Now, you love them, but he's specifically, I believe, praying for the love that they should have for one another. Now, this shouldn't, shouldn't surprise us because one of the last things that Jesus, when he was with his disciples, one of the last things that he, he said to them, he says, you know, I want to give you a, a new command that you might love one another. And then he says this, and by your love, all men will know that you are my disciples. When Jesus said that in, in John chapter 15, Jesus could have said anything, you know, he says, you know what, this is, this is what I, I, I want you to be known for. And this is how people will know that you're my disciples, that you're a follower, follower of me, that you're a follower of Jesus. He could have said, you're, I, this is how they're going to know your incredible self-discipline. He could have said, your, your, your sexual morality. 
He could have said, you know what? This is how people are going to know that you're mine um, by, by your giving and your, and your generosity. He could have said a number of, of different things by, by the knowledge that you have of, of my scriptures. Now, all those things are good, obviously. But the one thing that Jesus says that people will know that you are mine by the way that you love one another. Love is powerful. And obviously because Paul has the heart of Jesus, it's almost a word-for-word -word prayer that he says to the Colossian church. He says, I'm, I, I want to pray for your love, for your, for your love for one another. You know, Paul wrote a number of what we would call one another's in his writings to his various churches that he visited and, and founded and planted. He's, he pray for one another, be kind to one another, be gentle with one another, encourage one another, admonish one another, teach one another. There are just a number of one another's. And all of them stem from the big one another that Jesus lays out in John chapter 15. By this, all men will know that you are mine by the way that you love one another. There is something about love. And we're going to talk about that in a deeper level in just a moment. So everything that Paul says, he goes, this is what I pray, that your love, and then he describes what mature love looks like. He says that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and in all discernment, that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense to the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. That, that is what the scripture says of what mature love looks like. So we're going to walk through just kind of four aspects or four things that we can pull out just of these three verses of what, of what mature look, love looks like, according to the Apostle Paul. And, and here's the first one. Love is plentiful. You know, scripture says, this is, I, this is I pray. I pray that your love may abound still more and more. Now, the Philippian church was a church that loved each other. They, they demonstrated their love for one another. They also demonstrated their love for Paul. If they didn't love Paul, they wouldn't have sent a guy while they heard that he was in prison in Rome to encourage uh, him and to, to bring him a gift and to make his time spent in Rome just a little more manageable or a little more tolerable, that they did a lot of things out of love. So Paul is not saying to them, you know what, you guys need to, to love each other because you're not loving each other. He, he is saying that my prayer for you is that the love that you have already for one another will abound still more and more. Isn't that interesting what Paul says? He's writing to a church that already is a loving church, but yet his prayer still for them is that their love would still abound more and more. And the reason why, because Paul understands where godly love, spirit-enabled love comes from, the Holy Spirit. And there's no limit on the abounding love of the Holy Spirit. You see, whenever Paul talks about the fruit of the Spirit, and the fruit of the Spirit, he gives us a great list in, in, in the letter to the Galatian church. You know, the fruit of the Spirit is kindness, joy, gentleness, uh, self-control. And, and there's a number of fruits of the Spirit. And a lot of the fruit of the Spirit is also connected with, and we've already talked about this, the one another's of Paul. Be kind to one another. Kindness is one of the fruits of the Holy Spirit. Be gentle with one another, right? Forgive one another. I mean, a lot of the fruit of the Spirit are connected with the one another's that Paul outlines. It's a, The one another's are, are uh, tangents or, or branches from the command that Jesus says in John chapter 15 to, to love one another. Now, when Paul talks about this, and when Jesus talks about this in John chapter 15, he is not talking about a human capacity to love. Just like there is a human capacity to love, and everybody has it, non-believers can love to a human capacity. And the same is true with, 
what we would call some of these attributes like gentleness and kindness and, and forgiveness and, and, and bearing with one another and being patient with one another. All of us as human beings, and some of it are different depending on your personality, your background, your experiences, you have a certain human capacity for kindness, for patience, for bearing with one another, for forgiveness. But every single person has a human capacity that comes to an end. You have an ending point with your kindness. You have an ending point with your patience. You, you've reached your limit. You have an ending point with your gentleness. You have an ending point with, with your forgiveness. You can forgive certain things, but in your humanness, you cannot forgive some things, everything, right? I think we can understand that every single person has a human capacity, a limitation to be kind or gentle and to be loving. When Paul talks about the love here, that he wants them to abound still more and more. When Jesus talks about in John chapter 15, that all men will know that you are mine by the way that you love one another, they are not saying love in a human capacity. They are saying when your love comes to an end, when your gentleness comes to an end, when your kindness comes to an end, when your patient reach, reaches its limit, that is when the Holy Spirit takes over and enables you to love beyond your human capacity, to be patient beyond your human capacity, be kind beyond your human capacity, to forgive beyond your human capacity. The fruit of the Spirit is dependent upon the indwelling spirit that resides in every single person who is a believer in Jesus. You cannot possess the fruit of the spirit without the spirit. If you don't have the, the spirit, you can be kind to a point. You can be patient to a point. You can be gentle to a point. You can forgive to a point. And every single person has a different capacity. This is not what Paul is talking about. Because he's talking to a church that already loves one another pretty well. But he's saying, I want you to tap in to the Holy Spirit that resides inside of you. Because that enables you to love, abound more and more. You've had great demonstrations of love. And Paul was a recipient of that. There was somebody who came and visited him that the, the church sent. He had a great demonstration of love. But he also understands that the Holy Spirit enables us to love in, in a way that all men will know that you are mine by the way that you love one another. And you know the early church, when they grasped and understood this, this is how Christianity spread and took off. And Jesus understood this. Obviously, he did. When he was with his disciples, he washed their feet. It was one of the last times that he was with them and he's washing the feet of the one who's gonna deny him. He would have washed Judas's feet as well. And he was saying something about how his kingdom is going to be spread. It's not gonna be by the gold. That's not the golden rule. It's not gonna be by the sword. It's gonna be a kingdom that erupts, that it spreads, that, that, that continues to overflow from the towel, being a servant, having a servant's heart by, by loving one another well. And when the outside world sees this, that that love is different, that it's beyond the human capacity, they're going to say, where does that come from? And that's why Jesus says in John chapter 15, all men will know that you are mine by the way that you love one another. Now, Paul continues to say, after he says, I want your love to abound still more and more. He says, but abounding love has boundaries. In fact, that's number two. Not only is Paul saying that your love should be plentiful. Here he says, I pray that your love may abound more and more. But he also says that your love should be precise. That there are boundaries to abounding love. And he lays them out right here. He says, this I pray, that your love may abound more and more in, and here are the two boundaries 
kind of like banks in a river. If, if your love doesn't flow in this right direction, Paul does not say, you know what? I just want your love to abound more and more and you just do whatever you think you need to do with no boundaries, with no right, with no wrong. There's a lot of people who feel as if people should kind of you know, express their love in whatever way. So if you wanna go ahead and do this physically with your body to whatever, if you want to, you know, how, however you want to do that, that's crazy love. That's, that doesn't make sense, right? And so what Paul does, he says, there, there are two boundaries of abounding love because this abounding love, if it overflows the banks, it will just cause flooding, it will cause damage. And so if you go outside of these two boundaries, and the two boundaries are this, knowledge, and discernment. These are the banks that allows the abounding love to flow in the right direction. Now, what, what's the first bank? The first bank that he talks about here in the scripture is, is knowledge. He's talking about knowledge. What's knowledge? Knowledge is truth. You may have an abounding love right around Christmas time when you, you buy a bicycle for your son or your daughter or your grandchild, right? And you're abounding love. You want them to have as much fun on that bicycle as they possibly can. But if you don't put that bicycle together correctly, if you don't attach the brakes, if you don't give them boundaries of where they can ride and how they can ride, and I mean, you are putting them in, in danger. There are certain boundaries of truth as a parent or a grandparent that you provide for your children. You, you love them with abounding love, but you understand that to love them correctly in order for them to not have damage done to themselves, there are certain boundaries. There are truth boundaries. There has, there's a knowledge that you have that your children, because they're young, may not quite be able to comprehend. And so you place the boundary of knowledge. That's why you follow the instructions of how to put a bike together. That's why you instruct them correctly of where they can ride their bicycle because you don't want any damage to come to them. Well, same thing is true with our Heavenly Father. He knows the, the boundaries of truth of how we ought to live our life. He gives us moral boundaries, boundaries. He gives us sexual boundaries. He gives us relational boundaries. He gives us boundaries regarding our time and our treasure and our talent. He gives us these boundaries. When we go outside of these boundaries, it will cause damage to us. It will cause damage to others. And who gets to set the boundaries? Well, the Father does. The Heavenly Father sets the boundaries of appropriate love within the bank of truth. And so when you go outside of these boundaries or you say, well, you know, that person who, who, who says that they know the Lord, I, I just can't say that because I love them so much that what, they, that what they're doing is not lining up with the boundary of truth. You, you are really allowing them to damage themselves without giving them sort of some counsel. You do it in the right way. And that's actually the second bank. You have knowledge and truth, but you also apply that knowledge and truth. What does the scripture say? In discernment. Now, what is discernment? Discernment is how to apply that truth in the situation. Discernment implies the correct tone, tone of voice. It replies tact. It implies that there needs to be the right timing. It implies, I believe as well, relationship. Because when you have hard truth without love, the Apostle Paul says that you're nothing more than a clanging cymbal. You're, you're just a resounding gong. You may be saying the right words, but if somebody doesn't if you're not discerning on how to appropriately with timing and tact and with love, how to apply that truth, nobody's going to listen to you, right? And so discernment is very linked and close in association to, to wisdom. It's the how do I apply the truth, that's one bank, but also in a way with discernment because you want it to be listened to. And both those banks 
are necessary. If you just have knowledge without, <coughs> excuse me, without love, according to 1 Corinthians 13, you're just going to be a loud noise, right? And so you apply loving discernment with how you communicate your truth. You do it in relationship. You do it with gentleness and respect. That's what the scripture tells us. You do it with the right tone. You do it with the right tact. And it's always better, if possible, to do it within the context of a loving relationship. And so Paul says, this is what mature love looks like. It's abounding. It's spirit-enabled. It is also within the banks of knowledge, truth, and discernment. And then here is our third aspect of mature love. It's pure. The scripture says in this, I pray that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and in all discernment, that you may approve the things that are excellent, right? With the knowledge of knowledge and discernment, and that you may be sincere. Your love has to be without improper motives. Uh, this idea of sincere love, pure love, so that it will not offend until the, the day of Christ. Probably the, the best example of insincere love with a loving act or something that usually is called something that is an act of love would be Judas's kiss, right? We know Judas Iscariot goes up to Jesus, kisses him, and what does Jesus say? What you're about to do do it quickly. The act of the kiss was something that all of us would say, and that's, a, that's an act of love. But the insincerity that Jesus understood, what, what Judas was doing, the, the insincerity, it was an offense. It was an offense to him. He knew the motive behind that kiss. And when someone picks up that you have an insincere motive behind an act of love, it's going to be offensive. This, this word sincere is a very interesting word in the, in the Latin. It's two parts, sin and seer, which sin means absence of or without, and sera is wax. So you put it together, it's the absence of wax, right? Now, what in the world does that mean? Well, in ancient days, what they would do is if you were a statue maker or if you were uh, making a bowl or pottery or whatever it may be and something broke, you would take wax mixed with sand or dirt or whatever and you would use it as a kind of like ancient gorilla glue and, and put it together. Well, if you were in the marketplace and you're selling a plate, well, somebody might take that plate and hold that plate up to the sun and the sun will, will expose the cracks, the wax. It's impure, right? And then you can kind of haggle with the price. That's the idea here is that your, your, your love should be not fake. Your, your, your love should be without wax. And maybe you've heard somebody say, you know, such and such a person, they just like to hear themselves talk. They're just waxing on about this particular subject. That's kind of the idea that, you know, just somebody just kind of waxes on about a subject. They just like to hear themselves talk. They really don't believe what they're saying. They're insincere. And so what Paul is saying here is your, your love needs to be pure. Your love has to be with the, the mo your, your communication of whatever loving act must have a, a, a pure motive without some type of sneaky kind of, you know, what I can receive, right? You know, a pure act of love without any thought of something beneficial to you to be reciprocated to you. Now, sometimes these things are easy to spot. Sometimes you think someone is insincere, and they may be completely sincere. But if you ever pick up on something, you know this. You probably will never trust that person again when you have an exposure of their, of, of their motive. And, and this is what Paul is saying. And you're, 
as you're conducting your, your love with one another, make sure your motives are pure. Make sure that you are sincere. Make sure that your act of love is not fake and doesn't have any, it's not waxy. Maybe we, we would use the word today, cheesy. That you don't have any cheesy acts of love with a hidden motive. And here's the fourth mark. Love is also purposeful. And so it's, it's plentiful, it's precise, it's, it's, it's pure, but it's also purposeful. And this I pray that your love may abound more and more in the banks of knowledge and discernment, that you may approve anything that is excellent, but also it's sincere, it's pure, without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ, to the glory and praise of God. It's purposeful. Your act of love, however, whatever form that it takes, and there's a number of way that you, ways that your love can take shape. But as long as it is done in a way in such within this banks of knowledge and discernment and pure motives and the abounding love flowing in the right direction, right? If it's coming from the Holy Spirit, it can take several forms, your love. Sometimes people need love with hard words. Sometimes people need love with very comforting words. Sometimes love comes in the form of very strong discipline. Sometimes love takes the form with, you know what, we're going to bury this, bury the hatchet, we're going to forgive, and we're going to move on. Sometimes love will take the form of, you know what, I've been as generous as I can with you, giving you a handout. Now I'm going to give you a hand up, right? I mean, love will take several different forms. And it takes discernment. It takes knowledge of truth. And it's going to take several forms. A loving act can take several forms. But as long as it brings glory and praise to God, right? So whatever you do, this is Colossians 3.17. So whatever you do, whether in work or deed, in the demonstration of your love, do it all for the glory of God. Whatever you do, if you have the context of godly mature love, will bring purposeful praise and glory to the Lord. Will the Lord bless you, the Lord keep you, may his face shine upon you, and give you strength until we meet again. God bless.